Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar on the impacts of Intel, a housing panel discussion with guest panelists from around the region. This is our first event of our impacts of Intel summer series. My name is Jerrica Logan and I am the outreach coordinator at the Center for Urban and Regional Analysis, otherwise known as Kira. I will be your host for this event. If you require closed captioning, you will find a box at the bottom of the screen called CC. Click the box and select show subtitles. This will allow you to see the subtitles during the presentation. Feel free to submit questions at any time of the webinar using the Q&A box. We will ask as many of your questions as we can in the last portion of the presentation. And if we do not get to your question, we do apologize. If you have any additional questions following this event, please feel free to email me at logan.433 at osu.edu. This event is also approved for one AICP CM credit. To claim your credit, please log on to your My APA account on the APA website and enter in the event to your online CM event log. There will also be a brief sur survey at the end of this webinar. If you have time, please provide your feedback. I'm now gonna pass it over to our director, Harvey Miller. Hello everyone and good afternoon. Welcome to our uh, webinar series on the impacts of Intel. Um, this is a big deal for Central Ohio and the state of Ohio, and there, Cura is addressing some of the concerns and issues surrounding the impacts of Intel in this summer seminar series, where we're going to talk to local experts, both uh, at the Ohio State University and in the community, and talk about what they think is coming and how we should prepare for this really massive impact on, um, on Ohio. Um, today's panel is on housing. On July 15th, we'll have a panel discussion on development, on economic development, the impacts of Intel on that. July 29th, we'll talk about the impacts on transportation, how we prepare for that. And then finally, on August 5th, we'll have a panel discussion on the impacts on energy and water in central Ohio. So um, check out um, our events page at cura.osu.edu for all these events. Um, also, you can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And if you go to cura.osu.edu, you can sign up for our newsletter. And that way you'll never miss any of these really exciting events that are brought to you by the Center for Urban Regional Analysis at The Ohio State University. So let's um, start with our panel discussion. First, I will introduce our panelists. Uh, Jennifer Knoll, she is Associate Director for Community Development with the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, or MORPC as they're more commonly known, here in Columbus. Jennifer leads a passionate team focused on housing and development, active transportation, and improving access to the region's trails and waterways. Jennifer's team oversees key regional initiatives, including the Central Ohio Regional Housing Strategy, Insight 2050, and Central Ohio Greenways. Jennifer holds a master's in city regional planning and a certificate in creative placemaking from The Ohio State University. Thank you for joining us today, Jennifer. Robert Vogt is a partner in the real estate market research firm of Vogt Strategic Insights. Mr. Vogt has conducted market feasibility studies for the past 35 years. In that time, he has conducted, written, reviewed more than 20,000 market studies for market rate and affordable tax credit apartments, as well as studies for single family subdivisions, condominiums, mixed use developments, office, real retail space and elderly housing throughout the United States. Mr. Vogt is a founding member of the National Council of Housing Market Analysts, an association formed to bring standards and professional practices to the real estate market feasibility analysis. He is also a past chairman of that association. Mr. Vogt is a member of the Columbus Board of Commission Appeals and a member of the Urban Land Institute. He has a degree in finance, real estate, and urban land economics from The Ohio State University. Thanks for joining us today, Rob. And finally, Erin Prosser is the Assistant Director of Housing Studies for the City of Columbus. Mm -hmm. She brings nearly two decades of public and private sector experience leading the planning, development, and engagement to numerous high profile projects. She recently served as Director of Community Development in the Department of Planning, Architecture, and Real Estate at the Ohio State University, where she oversaw the revitalization of Lineland Park, including the addition of 500 affordable housing units and the 7.5 acre redevelopment of the 15th Avenue and High Street intersection, which is looking really nice, I have to say, Aaron. 
Uh, prior to her time at the university, she, was a, she worked as a planner at MKSK Studios, a multidisciplinary design and planning firm, and served as a planner for Franklin County's Economic and Planning Department. <clears throat> she holds a master's degree in city regional planning from, guess where, the Ohio State University, and a bachelor's degree in philosophy from Bowling Green State University. So again, welcome as well, Aaron. So what I'll do is I'll ask the panelists to each give an opening statement. We'll start with Jennifer, then go to Robert, and then Aaron. So uh, Jennifer, the floor is yours. Thank you, Harvey, and thanks to everyone at Kira for inviting Morpsey and me to be part of the conversation today. So Morpsey is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for Columbus. We're also a regional council for all of Central Ohio. We have a 15 county area of service. And Morpsey is really a convening organization. We bring together people from across the region who represent not only communities or local governments, but really all of the pieces that make up our communities. So businesses, nonprofits, service providers, community organizations, education, and so on. And as conveners, our goal is really to work with our members and partners to find common ground on important issues that impact not only one community or even one county, but truly all of Central Ohio. So we collaborate together to plan for the future of our region around these big issues. And housing is absolutely one of these important regional issues. I always say housing and population growth go hand in hand. So just for a little bit of context, Central Ohio is a region of about 2.4 million residents today. We're on track to become a region of around 3 million residents by 2050, probably a little bit sooner. And if we take a look at the most recent census figures, by most accounts, Central Ohio is performing pretty well in the growth category. So there's about 400 metro areas around the country. Of those, Central Ohio ranked 27th in terms of growth by the most recent census. And especially here in the Midwest, Columbus performed really well. Columbus was the only city to grow by more than 100,000 people in the Midwest. So these numbers might be a little bit shocking, but in many ways, they should not be surprising. Growth is not new for our region, and for that matter, really neither is attracting big companies like Intel, which we'll be talking more about today. We've been doing both of these for a long time, for decades, and it's likely that we're gonna to continue to do so. I don't mean to downplay the sort of the magnitude or the significance of the Intel announcement. It's certainly a really big deal. But I think what it does is it kind of proves to us that we can't take our foot off the accelerator when it comes to preparing for growth. And I think that's especially true when it comes to housing. Central Ohio is experiencing a housing shortage. This is something that's been kind of getting worse for a little over 10 years now. And the reality is we're simply not building enough homes to keep up with the rate of growth that we've been experiencing. And we can feel those impacts in a lot of different ways. I think one of the most obvious is probably in the skyrocketing sales prices that we've experienced recently. And that translates into higher rent rates too. I think another thing that we can sort of attribute to Intel's arrival here in Central Ohio is kind of really underscoring the urgency of addressing these housing challenges, in particular the shortage. So since Intel was announced, Morpsey has been working hand in hand with our sister organization in Lincoln County to convene listening sessions um, and workshops as well with our members and stakeholders. So we held our first listening session earlier this year. We just asked attendees to tell us, what are you excited about? What are you concerned about? And it probably comes as no surprise that housing was identified as the top concern. It's not just supply and demand. Um, we created a regional housing strategy for Central Ohio a couple of years ago. The folks on this panel were involved in that process. And we identified through that process five core issues that are really behind the region's housing challenges. So in addition to supply and demand, we're also seeing that many households face barriers when it comes to accessing housing. So Central Ohio's housing market is not an even playing field. Regardless of income, people of color, and particularly Black households, experience discrimination in the housing market and in lending practices. And this makes it much more difficult for them to obtain um, a home, whether they own or rent. Uh, there's not enough housing available for low income households. Um, simply put, new homes are built at higher price points, but as a region, we're also losing our supply of naturally occurring affordable housing. And then on the other end of things, the demand for rental assistance is far greater than the amount of funding that's available for it. We have growing demand for a more diverse housing stock. So Central Ohio is not only growing, it's also becoming more diverse. And yet nearly 80% of the region's housing stock remains traditional single family two-story homes. As the region becomes more diverse, we need our housing stock to reflect that diversity and support a wider range of ages, abilities, and household sizes. And the final core issue that we've identified is that many households experience what we call housing instability. 
And especially right now, as we continue to move forward from the pandemic, and particularly at this time when the cost of everything is continuing to soar, we're going to see more and more of our neighbors who are experiencing housing cost burden, evictions, homelessness, homes in need of repair. These are all indicators of housing instability. So the good news is that the regional housing strategy identifies a number of strategies to address these supply and affordability issues. morsi has been focused on providing support to our members to implement those strategies, but the actions are not just for local governments. They're strategies for real estate developers, lenders, service providers as well. Uh, and certainly, I think we're going to be touching on some of those as well as a number of other solutions with the panel today, and I am looking forward to the conversation. So thank you. Hey, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Robert, please. Uh, thanks, Harvey. Um, Jen, I think you did a pretty succinct description of what's going on in Central Ohio. Some, so some of my topics, I think uh, you've, you've sort of already touched on. But, you know, in my 35 year career doing real estate market research here in Central Ohio, I've never seen real estate conditions like this ever. Uh, I've never seen a more, um, I guess, if you want to call it a healthy real estate a rental market, you can, but for those folks who are disadvantaged, as you talked about, uh, the effect is rather dramatic. Um, I was taking a look at uh, some of the numbers recently regarding the number of uh, severe cost overburdened households. And <clears throat> a couple of years ago, when, when there was a task force that took a look at that, they identified 54,000 households here in, in central Ohio that were severely cost overburdened, which means that they are paying more than 50% of their income towards housing costs. Uh, I took a look at the numbers recently, and we've gone up to 69,000 households now that are in that predicament uh, just in three short years. When you combine that with the rental conditions where you've got occupancies of 97, 98% um, citywide, it is a real challenge for the lowest income households to try to find affordable and decent housing. You know, you combine that with the fact that uh, our research has shown that we have underbuilt by three to 4,000 units a year, and you can suddenly see that we've got a real crunch in terms of, of uh, housing development. Um, but we're really no different than anyone else in the national picture. I mean, uh, every market nationwide is experiencing a severe uh, housing shortage, and that's been due primarily to the cost of housing, the cost of materials, labor costs, cost of development, land costs, all of those items have raised dramatically. And because these have increased so fast and the price of housing, new housing has increased so fast, that has caused a lot of folks to remain in apartments. Um, it's good news for apartment developers, not so good news if you're a young family trying to move out into, into an affordable housing choice. And I expect to see these conditions to continue for some time. And as we talk about the Intel development, I think it's gonna have a profound impact on um, the labor force that, that not only provides direct jobs to the Intel project, but all the indirect jobs, the, the restaurants, the hotels, the, the service workers, the, um, um, all of these types of workers who are gonna be really challenged to find a housing choice, um, not only in proximity to the Intel, but frankly in central Ohio. So um, <clears throat> we know that if we are going to continue to attract new employers, we've got to diversify our housing base. And, and knowing that the market conditions as they exist now, it's going to be a real challenge. So uh, not only will it be a challenge, I think, for, for, um, for Central Ohio in general, but even the communities that surround the Intel site or nearby this Intel site are going to be challenged with all of these, re these requests for new developments. And we've got to find a way to balance ourselves between the demand for single family housing, the demand for multifamily housing, and we've got to find ways to get more affordable housing into these communities. Those are my comments. Okay, thanks so much, Robert and uh, Aaron. Thank you guys. And I, you know, Jennifer and Rob both gave a really good um, overall picture. So again, I'll try and keep my comments um, probably a little bit shorter, but, the city of Columbus last year um, identified the need for someone to really um, wake up every morning and think about housing, right? And so they created this position um, that I have the privilege of occupying here within the city of Columbus, which is assistant director of housing strategies. Um, and I'm very clear with folks that it's not an assistant director of affordable housing strategies, but housing strategies across the entire spectrum, because it is a system, right? And it is an ecosystem that we have not 
uh, given the care and feeding to over the years as a region that we need to, to be prepared for the job creation that's coming, not just with Intel, but with the, um, the other economic development efforts in the, in the region and the ways in which we've been growing um, our jobs by a pretty impressive clip. The issue is we haven't built our housing infrastructure to match that economic development efforts, right? And when we look across the region in the last economic cycle, 2009 to 2019, as a region, we were adding 2.8, two or sorry, 2.5 jobs uh, for every one house we built. So that is not sustainable, right? And I think at times I, I talk to people about, you know, whether or not the housing construction is what's driving the population growth. And it really is the job creation that drives the population growth. And then we are not keeping pace with our housing infrastructure. And what that leads to, and it's not just the volume, right? We're not building enough. We're not building what we need and we're not building it everywhere. And that is going to create additional challenges for us as a region around our broad affordability. So we are uh, living in a strange time where we do in fact have a housing crisis, but we are also relatively affordable compared to some of our peer cities around the nation. Both of those things are true. And right now what we have, and you know, Rob talked a little bit about it, the folks in our community that are most vulnerable are feeling the impacts now. And as we continue to exacerbate uh, that pressure on our housing system, it will continue to um, add additional folks that are feeling those impacts that are increasingly house cost, housing cost burdened, um, leading to live very far away in order to afford uh, decent, safe, stable housing. All the impacts we see in our peer cities, right? We, we have some cautionary tales to look at around the country to kind of show us where we're headed if we don't uh, make some significant changes. And that's the, the role that I have here at the city is to really look within the city of Columbus across our departments and figure out how to modernize the way that the city of Columbus engages uh, with our housing infrastructure. And that is going to uh, take a lift that not just can happen within the city of Columbus, but it needs to be a regional effort. And our jurisdictional partners uh, also need to, to come to the table and have a conversation about how we build a 21st century city which we cannot do on the regulatory framework from you know, the 20th century. And I think that's where we all have to shift the way we do business and the way we bring housing into our community so that we have not just the volume we need, but that we are directly supporting kind of big A affordable projects where we need to have dollars into those projects in order to have the rents uh, meet the needs of some of our residents. Um, <laughs> We are looking at uh, you know, an additional affordable housing bond in the fall for the city of Columbus to continue to invest in those projects. Uh, the previous bond from 2019 was $50 million and it got us about 1,300 of those big A affordable uh, units in the community. And so looking to continue to expand that, uh, looking at ways in which we need to, you know, the supply will really address the, the broad need for housing in the community, but we, it is not going to be as nimble as we need it to be to address the neighborhood changes that are happening um, at a much more uh, directed level and in, in impacting our residents much more directly. And so we're going to need to look at things like council member favors, housing for all legislation package that looked at source of income and rent receipts and some other opportunities to protect our tenants. Um, looking at expansion of housing stability and homelessness prevention programs, making sure that folks can stay housed. Um, and not fall into our shelter system through expansion of programs like our emergency rental assistance that we've seen the last, uh, you know, under, with COVID. Um, and really understanding how we can make sure that our low income homeowners are protected. MORPC does a lot of work with our low income homeowners to help them stay in their homes. Uh, we need to expand those programs and we need to understand where those folks are at risk um, and really build in those protections for those folks. Um, and then finally, we need to include everyone in this prosperity. And we have a lot of jurisdictions in this region. There are a lot of different zoning codes. There are a lot of different development review processes. All of those contribute to that economic segregation. And if we are not gonna accidentally unwind those consequences. We're gonna have to be deliberate and thoughtful about how we develop moving forward so as not to continue to exacerbate that economic segregation. Okay. Thanks so much, Aaron, and thanks uh, Jennifer and Rob for good opening statements. Um, you know, Aaron, you anticipated my first question I was going to ask the panel, which is, you know, this is not unusual, the housing shortage that we're experiencing here in Columbus. 
what are the solutions? What should we do about it? And you've just talked a bit about what the city of Columbus is doing. Maybe I'd like Jennifer and Rob to talk about Morpsey and the private sector, and then perhaps we can circle back to you and hear some more details if you'd like to share with us. But okay, so tell us, what, what do we do about this, Jennifer? Yeah, absolutely. So it's certainly a complex challenge, right? And you know, I think that's absolutely where we need to start is by acknowledging that it's not going to be one solution or one solution fits all to address this. And really it's going to be all hands on deck. Certainly the things that are happening in the city of Columbus, we would absolutely support and encourage to see more of. Um, through the regional housing strategy, we produced a menu of over hundred actions with the potential to be started or scaled in central Ohio. Um, that's awesome, but I know that can also be overwhelming for folks to know where to start. And so there's a few ways that, that we would help folks to kind of navigate that menu. One of the ways you can think about is through housing submarkets, and this is really Rob's expertise, so I don't want to go too far into it, but um, we have a number of different types of housing um, submarkets that exist across central Ohio. And some of the actions that might make a lot of sense for Columbus neighborhoods may not make the same kind of sense for neighborhoods in Union County or Fairfield County or Madison County. And so we're able to kind of think through what does uh, on that scale. And we can also think through the actions that would be most relevant based on who, who you are as a player in this. Are you a policymaker, a developer, a lender, um, a community organization? We've got actions for you. Um, we have an advisory board that helped us through that process to kind of filter through that menu of actions and identify five that might make the most sense to really get started with right away based on kind of momentum and, and urgency. And we are seeing some action around those. Um, the green tape development review process is a, is a big one um, that I think we're starting to see some momentum around in communities across central Ohio. The idea here is that it can take some time to get a housing proposal through the development review process before you even break ground, let alone the time it takes to actually build. So there might be things that communities can do to make that process more efficient. And any sort of time that we can save in the process can potentially save us some money on the back end as well. So those are cost savings we can realize through that process. Another big policy intervention is one that Aaron already mentioned, um, protections for residents. So source of income protections is a really good way to help reduce the barriers that folks face to accessing housing. We've seen a number of communities across the region uh, pass ordinances in, in recent months that protect their residents from discrimination in the market. This is a great first step toward acknowledging the, to the challenge and saying we're not going to stand for discrimination in our communities. We're also seeing some great momentum around sort of innovative partnerships, I think. There was a great partnership last year that had this opportunity to develop um, a model for a home that you could build for, I think it was like $175,000. Um, and that was just a really cool way to see some, some fresh faces in this conversation, but also to see something that has real potential uh, to be scaled up throughout the region. So I think those innovative partnerships are gonna be really critical to, to moving this forward as well. Great. Robert, from the private sector's perspective, what do you think? Well, you know, it's a, it's an interesting uh, thing to think about when we're talking about Intel and the potential impact on Central Ohio. Um, we've been talking a little bit about affordable housing, but we're also going to need a lot of higher end housing. Uh, we were taking a look at the statistics that um, Austin had generated as a result of all of their new tech development, and the incomes in Austin increased dramatically over the past 10 years, uh, much faster than any of our peer cities, such as Nashville, uh, Charlotte, or, or here in Columbus. So what we're going to see is an increased demand for higher end properties. And, and similar to affordable properties, high end developers, high end property developers are struggling to find developable sites here in central Ohio to provide this product. They have zoning challenges, they have school issues, they've got uh, land costs, um, they've got entitlements. I mean, there's a whole host of things that are impacting the ability for developers to address this component. And I think we've got to make some changes to it. And unfortunately, uh, Columbus has actually taken the lead on trying to get, simplify the zoning process. But we've got a lot of communities that surround Intel that have their own agendas, their own process, uh, their own preferences, the minimum square footage requirements for lots, for example, um, that precludes the development of, of modest priced housing. So, you know, we've got a problem going throughout the entire spectrum, and I think it's going to be a real challenge to provide that housing, deliver that housing in a cost efficient manner, manner. and um, 
being challenged then by these various communities that are essentially putting up a lot of roadblocks preventing more housing to be de uh, de developed or delivered to the marketplace. Well, Aaron, would you like to add to that? And maybe you can talk a little bit about like what Columbus is doing in terms of zoning code reform. <clears throat> Yeah, I just want to echo both what Jennifer and Rob said, you know, there is not one silver bullet, right? We have a housing system that has, again, not been um, thought of regionally in terms of what we need. And it has been these individual communities that have sort of determined their destiny within their boundaries, uh, which has led us to just an overall infrastructure that's not particularly diverse in housing typologies, right? So to Rob's point about high-end um, homes that we'll need, right? I mean, when we talk to the gentleman from Austin, they have such a similar circumstance to us as being a really state government and university based town. And they had lived with their neighbors having salaries that were commiserate with those types of jobs. And when we look at Intel and the shift that will happen when tech salaries roll into this region, that is a direct impact, not just the volume of workers, but the fact that the median salary or average salary, I don't remember which one it is, um, is 135,000 for those positions. And so those folks are going to be coming into the market. We do need to have product for them so that there can be proper filtration in the system, right? I mean, the reason our most vulnerable are feeling the impacts today is because it is a down pressure system, right? I will likely go down in my housing costs if I can. And so I will occupy units that are hopefully that would be otherwise affordable to folks at the lower income. And as we keep pushing that system down, we've got folks that you know, millennials, you know, our largest age demographic is 32. They're ready to move into home ownership, but they can't find a house. So they're staying in that apartment, right? They're staying in that, in occupying that space. And so we don't have that proper filtration. And I think we need to look at all of our communities at a much more diverse types of housing because we over invested in single family. And that has allowed us to really create clogs in the system that don't allow us to properly um, meet everyone's needs and budgets. And I think that's also a part of what we have to think about as we collectively address the housing. Okay, very good. Um, so we've talked about like, there'll be a need for a wide range of housing, including high-end housing. We all know the story of Silicon Valley where people earn six figure salaries and still face long commutes because of problems with housing affordability. Are, are we looking at like that type of impact, do you think because of Intel? Or, um, you know. I'll, I'll take a shot at that, Harvey. I yeah. think we are gonna see some modest impacts of that. I think one of the limitations that Silicon Valley have is essentially it's a Silicon Valley. It's very limited geographically. I mean, the one thing we have here in central Ohio is a lot of land and that we have the ability to um, spread ourselves out a bit. Um, and, and so, you know, I think the challenge may be, how do we get that land zoned for, for the correct housing? How do we get the infrastructure in place to serve it? How do we make utilities available? I mean, I think that's one of the other advantages that we have is a, is a good water supply uh, to be able uh -huh. to serve many of these, these new housing units. So there's a lot of factors to our favor that I think will not uh, affect us as, as broadly as it has in some of these other high-end markets. And I think we're gonna have to get comfortable with building up and not always looking out, right? I mean, we do have um, affordable housing as you get further out from the center city, but then you are trading that one, the impact directly to the family where you have a transportation cost burden um, in, in replacing that housing cost burden. Uh, but then you also have the burden to the infrastructure of the roadway system, right? And the more we have folks on our roadways having to navigate and, and commute into different places that it does create strain on our system. And so I think where Columbus policies have shifted in the last couple of years is thinking about building up instead of building out, right? And densifying and um, how do we facilitate that uh, increased density within our borders so that we can support more families closer to where the job opportunities are. Jennifer, would you like to add something? I mute myself there. I, I mean, I certainly agree with the comments here. I, I, one thing that gives me hope is in addition to having you know, the land that makes us different from Silicon Valley, I think what advantage we also have is that we get to sort of benefit from Silicon Valley's hindsight, right? And so we can kind of see what worked and what didn't work, what they would have done differently through the benefit of hindsight. So even though there's this potential that we could replicate, I think maybe some of the things they wish they would have done differently, I think we also have the potential to get this right by learning from maybe our, our peer regions and peer cities that are a little out in front of this uh, and trying to turn the narrative 
with some of these approaches that Rob and Aaron mentioned. Okay, so um, let's let's shift this a bit towards economic development and talk a bit about um, workforce development. Um, do you think this housing shortage will affect the ability of Intel to recruit workers for its plant? And um, how do we make sure that these type of considerations are on the table and being considered when we talk about major economic development projects like this? You know, I Anyone? think in talking with employers generally, we know that housing is a really critical issue for them. Certainly, it's a lot easier to recruit and retain talent when you can promote that you're within a community that offers a variety of housing choices and a variety of housing price points, right? And so I, I think for most employers, that's, that's something that they really look to and that truly that they really need for their workforce as well. Um, so I would imagine Intel's thinking about that too. I think it also is important to think about those that support some of these big job creation endeavors, right? I mean, we have staff in our community that we rely on um, who are making wages that are quickly going to be priced out of the market. And I think where we need to be thoughtful is also not just the folks that are coming in to the, with these big job uh, gets, but making sure that the support uh folks that we rely on are also afforded the opportunities around the community, right? And so that there are affordable options on all corners of our region, I think is a really important part of making sure that they have, again, close proximity to those job opportunities. Um, you know, one thing we talk about, we talk about recruitment and retention, but another big part of housing stability is productivity, right? If you are not ha stably housed, you are likely not stably employed. And your ability to show up, to be productive, to all of the other things that we rely on is challenged if you do not have stable housing. And if you lose your housing, you're extremely likely to lose your job. And so where those, those folks are kind of in that space where we need to be really deliberate and thoughtful about building in a diversity of units so they have opportunities close to the job centers. You know, Harvey, I'm not so sure that Intel took a close look at what our housing situation was before they made their decision here. I mean, I think if they had gone in and, and done at least some due diligence regarding the uh, inventory of housing or the housing delivery systems, mm -hmm. They may not realize that we have those uh, the ability to deliver the kind of products that I think some of their employees are going to have an expectation for. So uh, I, I think they uh, the fortunate piece that we have here is we've got some good developers in central Ohio that I think are going to be up to the challenge to be able to 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 provide those kinds of housing choices. But um, I think, as, as, as both Aaron and, and Jen have said, we are going to be challenged uh, to draw in additional employers if we really don't, if we don't begin to address these kinds of housing issues. And, you know, as we see, uh, even we've even got some distribution like Amazon that are out in Licking County and, and Madison County that, you know, we're seeing employees drive in from Springfield and Urbana and, and Zanesville to support some of these job positions. That can't be sustained for a long for a long period of time unless we had decent public transportation system, which is another whole uh, point of topic. But um, uh -huh. I, I really do think we will be impacted if we don't take a very close look and develop strategies to address this housing need in Central Ohio as it impacts economic development. Right, and and transportation is a big part of that. And I just want to remind the audience that on July 29th we will have a discussion on transportation, although we recognize it's difficult to separate housing and transportation. They're two sides of the same coin. Um, so you raised a point about some of the impacts like in Licking County, Robert. I'd like to talk a bit about that. Do we have any like ideas or forecasts about where people are going to be moving, where we're going to see most of this housing impact? Will it be in the city of Columbus? Will it be in New Albany? Will it be throughout the region? Or is that just kind of I, I think you point. just identified all the above, Harvey. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think we're going to see, and in fact, we have to. I mean, in order to accommodate this growth and, and new job development, and with not only Intel, but all the other developments that we've announced recently, we're going to see that kind of uh, a development occur in those, as I would call them, exurban or, or um, the far reaching community like Johnstown and, and Newark and, and Lancaster. We have surveyed these markets recently, and I've never seen occupancies as high as they've been in places like Newark and Johnstown. And, and the demand for uh, all types of housing in those communities is tremendous. And that's even before Intel is actually open. 
Um, mm -hmm. We've got some fabulous, fabulously well-occupied uh, housing markets in these ex-urban locations that um, are going to experience some dramatic growth. I think there was some discussion recently in Johnstown about how they're going to accommodate their growth. You know, we're going to see it occur not only in, in places like Newark and Johnstown, but it's going to spread into Delaware, Marysville, and even London, Ohio, as, as the demand for housing is just too great to accommodate within our, our current limitations of, of central Ohio. All the way to London, you think? I think so. Well, talking about economic development, we've got, you know, if you've been out to uh, uh, state or US 42 and 71, the distribution centers that are out there, mm -hmm. it's clear that they need additional housing options. Yeah, I would just add to that. So Morpsey produced a map earlier this year that shows the drive time from the Intel location. I think something like 20 counties are within an hour's drive of Intel. Um, and so, I mean, that's essentially all of central Ohio, even a little bit further. Um, and so I, I think it's realistic to believe that across the region, there's going to be growth and, and the need for more housing to support not only those direct workers at Intel, but all those ancillary businesses that are going to have workers as well. You know, Jenna, when you think about um, how many of those uh, communities within an hour of Columbus have really struggled economically over the past couple of uh -huh. decades, it could be a real positive impact on those communities. And, and the ability to remote work, uh, which I assume at least some will occur during Intel and, and maybe some of the related businesses, there should be a really very good positive impact on those communities uh, in terms of their own development. I want to double up on that, Rob, because I think sometimes we do talk about this as a housing crisis, and it is, and we do have to act, and we do have to be, uh, have a sense of urgency about it, but with this growth also comes tremendous opportunity for a lot of the communities, and I think if we can shift into thinking about what it means to bring new neighbors into communities, how they support small businesses, how they're going to um, add to the community. I think there is, you know, we talk about public transit, we're going to need additional density, right? And we're going to need additional residents to support um, this, those systems. And so there are benefits that come if the growth is planned for and thoughtful and these communities um, really step forward to determine their future in a positive way that includes the development, right? And, and the idea that, that any of us will be able to just sort of shutter the, the impacts off and, and not have development in our communities is not going to be a sustainable option. Um, and so figuring out what that de destiny is for your community is a really important part of making sure that you capture the opportunities that are coming. Yeah, and I think that these communities really need to get prepared today for this. Uh, you uh -huh. know, I think sometimes that they're their ability to plan for future growth is somewhat limited because they were so uh, exposed to what had happened during the past 20 years. And, and, you know, to some degree, I think we need to kind of reach out to these communities and say, hey, folks, get ready, because it's going to come a lot faster than, than, than you think. So before I turn it over to the audience for um, q and I'm going to turn it over to Jerrica to, to read some of the audience questions. Uh, Jennifer, I want you to address that, the, the kind of regional strategy here being, you know, someone from Morpsey, you take a regional perspective. Um, what do we need to do to have this region work better together in order to uh, deal with this housing crisis and with the coming impacts of Intel and housing? Yeah, so it, it absolutely takes a regional approach, right? And I think I think we've heard that echoed here today, and, and we would certainly agree. Um, absolutely, our focus as a member organization is in providing support and resources to our communities. We're asking them to think critically, you know, do you have housing supportive policies in place? Is your comprehensive plan up to date? Do you have a zoning code that matches? Have you thought about where those strategic locations are within your community for growth? Those are really good starting points. Um, yes, it can be a, a process to, to go through those updates. And so we also want to be thinking about what those sort of quick hits, shorter term strategies could be to help accommodate um, growth and be thinking differently about housing in the meantime. And that's where I think those partnerships become really important. There's a role for all of us to play in this and just sort of, you know, having the conversations, being engaged in the conversations. And, um, you know, if, if you have a neighbor who says, for example, like, I'm really opposed to this new development that's being proposed in the community. Can you have the conversation about them about why that's needed um, and what benefits or amenities having those additional rooftops will bring to your community? Um, you know, if, if you don't have the ice cream shop or the, the coffee shop or the local business today, the kinds of things that are going to attract it is more, more neighbors. And so if we can think about the positive benefits, those are some of the ways that we can help communities to really start to think differently about accommodating um, more neighbors and, and more households. 
Okay, great. I'm going to turn it over to Jerrica now, who's going to uh, field some of the audience questions. Please, Jerrica. Great. So we have um, a couple of questions that are, are similar to each other. So uh, one in particular to being in, uh, in respect to gentrification. So what can we do to decrease the risk of gentrification and inequality within um, Intel coming to the region? And similarly, how can we utilize Intel's appearance to increase access, um, increase some access into neighborhoods of opportunity? One thing I'll say about that, so for the regional housing strategy, we produced a displacement risk analysis, which took a look at communities across the region and a number of um, data sets and data points to identify which neighborhoods might be at the greatest risk of displacement due to increased investment in a neighborhood. Um, and the reason for that is really important. We're in the process right now of updating that to make it a, a current resource for our members. But the reality is the resources to address challenges within our communities are limited. And so communities really have to make some hard decisions around where to prioritize those resources. Having an analysis or a tool like that to help identify where neighborhoods might be at the greatest risk is, is a place we can start and we can, we can start to be strategic with those investments. So that's one way that we're working to address it is by providing the data in a way that communities can utilize um, and turn into some positive outcomes. You know, I think that's kind of a broader issue, the gentrification issue, and not not necessarily related to Intel. I don't, I, for example, I don't see Intel uh, creating gentrification issues in New Albany. Um, I say that sort of half jokingly, but um, you know, I think where where that development occurs will probably minimize the potential impact on some communities. Um, so I, I'm not as worried about it, and I, I understand the importance of how, how that is, but I'm not sure Intel is really going to make gentrification a major issue, at least as it relates to its location and the impact it's going to have in, in Northwest uh, or Northeast Columbus and Licking County. Although, although you did, I just want to say, although you did mention it, you'll see, we'll see housing impacts all the way out to places like London. So yeah, there's a possibility I, for that. That's true. And, and, and Harvey, that's why I kind of said this is a broader issue than just related to Intel. I mean, how do you affect uh, gentrification in neighborhoods? That's going to happen regardless of whether Intel is here or not. I don't think Intel is going to have a direct impact in gentrifying neighborhoods specifically. And, and that's why I say that it's a broader issue than just related to Intel. And I think when we talk about gentrification, I think what we are identifying is the outcome of displacement. Um, and the impacts that we see to those improving neighborhoods and where we can through, you know, legislative protections that we discussed earlier, um, make sure that those residents are protected. I think one of the ones that we've had a little more conversation about is around um, property tax burdens for some of the neighbors in these communities. You know, we need to have the opportunity from the state to be able to address some of those issues with our existing residents. That would be a really important part of keeping those folks in their homes. Um, but the goal of mixed income communities has to be uh, done with that kind of preservation in mind and making sure that we're preserving those affordability, that affordability in those communities. And there is a lot of strategies um, that we can look at through, uh, you know, extending affordability periods for our multifamily assisted projects that we currently have in communities. Uh, making sure that we see big A affordability go into those communities in a very directed way. Um, and then making sure that we have those protections in place for our renters and our low-income homeowners to make sure that they don't get displaced uh, as the neighborhood improves. And so I do think there's some public policy tools uh, that we can all utilize to start to uh, stabilize some of those families so we don't see the outcome of gentrification, which is, is what we're seeing in some of our, some of our neighborhoods. Great, thank you. So our next question is, um, how did this ho housing shortage happen? Were previous generations not able to see millennials as the next largest generation and um, that would need housing for their family? Boy, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, I, think it's, I think it's that factor. I think uh, the fact that uh, the cost of housing had increased so rapidly, so much more rapidly than anyone had expected. If you go back to the Great Recession and look at the kind of housing values that existed back then and then look to see where housing exists today, uh, housing went up tremendously faster than wages did and, and uh, you know, limited the ability for, for many families to buy it. So 
Um, we also had an increasing share in uh, one, one and two person households that typically don't buy single family housing. So they were kind of a built in market for, for apartments. And, and frankly, a lot of that has not changed that we still have the largest share of, of households today in apartments is still one person households. And I, I expect that to continue uh, for some time in the future. Um, but we also saw a lot of changes, I think, in communities themselves that really impacted how we were going to develop housing. And it, it had become such a challenge. A lot of folks just threw up their hands and say, the heck with it, we're not going to do this, that it's too hard to develop housing. And now we're starting to see the backlash of that. And, and um, so there's not one correct answer to all this. It's a combination of factors that have all contributed to this tremendous shortage that we've got of, of housing right now. And it really is a national level uh, circumstance, right? Yeah. And so coming out of 2008, where we really lost a lot of our home builders, uh, we lost that production capacity, yeah. uh, which is a nationwide issue. Um, and then I think I just want to double down on Rob's point about the neighborhood opposition to housing. Um, it is pervasive and it has become an obstacle in every community. And every time we are losing those units, when Rob talked at the beginning about the deficit units we are every year in construction, those are each one of those projects. And so where we have these conversations about the value of our affordability and the importance of our affordability as a community, uh, but yet we are individually making decisions that are contrary to that in our communities every single time we turn down a residential project. And that is true across central Ohio, right? And so we have to have a conversation as a community if those really are our values and that really is a priority to maintain our affordability, we are going to have to accept new neighbors into our communities. And it, and it has to be a balance here and it cannot be just single family. We've got to encourage these communities to accept okay. multifamily as a viable housing choice, which they so many times just reject because they think it's going to impact the schools or impact their uh, property base or or the values in their community, all of which has been dispelled by study after study showing that that's not necessarily true. Great. So um, our next question is, there's a lot of chatter about permitting, building regulations, and zoning restrictions being partly responsible for increasing the cost of housing construction. I'm not yet convinced. What do the panelists think about this? Well, you know, as I pointed out earlier, when you have a minimum square footage requirement for a single family lot, that's going to raise the cost. Um, if you, we were looking at some construction costs uh, for a multifamily project uh, that we got an estimate for last fall, and we just got it updated. The, the cost of materials increased 28% from last fall to June 1st a 28% increase. Now, where is that cost going to go? It's going to go directly to the cost of that house. So if, if you had a, a, a $300,000 house, now it's a $350,000 house. So, you know, and not only then the cost of, of, um, of materials, but the cost of labor, which is built into that cost estimate, but the cost of the land itself, and then the cost to, to bring utilities to a site. Um, I th think these are all factors that have, have really cause the price of housing to rise rather dramatically. And I think we just need to look at right sizing our regulatory frameworks, right? I mean, we really are in a current situation that may not have been as deliberately laid out and certainly didn't address where we are economically in, in central Ohio today, right? I mean, we haven't updated our zoning code in the city of Columbus in 70 years. The priorities and the issues facing our community 70 years ago are extremely different than what we've got today. And making sure that we right size uh, those regulatory frameworks to balance, right? I mean, housing production is important, so is water quality, so is, you know, there's a lot of priorities that a community has, and you just have to look across that framework and make sure that it is additive um, in really delivering on those priorities and not uh, hindering the opportunity to bring new housing into the community. And so that's why we're going to take a look specifically at the zoning framework, but also looking more broadly at the development review process we have in the city of Columbus and really looking especially at the time um, and understanding that uh, cost burden that is, again, to Rep's point, goes to the housing um, of that increased amount of time to kind of make it your way through the, the regulatory system. And I think it's important to know, too, that you can right size your zoning framework for the 21st century without compromising on the character of your community. Um, and that's, I think, a really critical piece for folks is, is 
they're not, it's not a zero sum game. It's not an either or, and, and you can absolutely retain the character of your community while having a code in a neighborhood that works for residents today as well as residents in the future. Jen, are we, are we seeing suburban communities embracing that idea to, to change their code to make it easier? Are we actually seeing that in practice or is it you know just sort of BS that we're talking about? <laughs> yeah, no, I am happy to say we are seeing communities across um, central Ohio who are going through that process of updating their plans and codes. I look at Reynoldsburg and Whitehall as two really great examples of where that's being done. Um, Reynoldsburg's had some remarkable success as a result and starting to bring some, some new development um, and attract some new amenities to the communities as, you know, as a result of going through that process. So we're really seeing real world examples of this working in, in central Ohio, finally. You know, I, I've made the comment before and I, I'll make it again to this group that, that I, think, I think the elected officials get it. They get the importance, how, how, much, how important it is to, re, to revise our zoning codes, how important it is to get new housing choices, but then you've got all the folks that elected those officials back there who are saying, no, 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 we don't want that in our community. We don't want that kind of housing in our community. It draws those kinds of tenants. We don't want that. And so, you know, it's, it's this balance that we have to find between the elected officials and what people are insisting on, which I think is a bit of an education process of the responsibility that we all have to make sure that folks understand the importance of, of creating these housing opportunities in suburban locations. And I think just rethinking about the way we build communities, right? I mean, when you look across our suburban uh, jurisdictions, you know, two very desirable places are Grandview and Bexley. That is also where we have our highest density outside the city of Columbus. There is no more diverse housing stock outside the city of Columbus than in Grandview Heights, right? They have a mix of different types of housing. You can, to Jennifer's point that, you know, community character can be maintained while beginning to develop a much more um, robust and um, adequate housing infrastructure. And I think we have great examples in central Ohio where that is really a great community, but also delivers on the housing in those communities that those communities need. Great, thank you guys. Um, so the next one is about the, um, an age related question. So how will this uh, impact the 65 and over community uh, when it comes to uh, affordable housing? I mean, I'll start with one quick example, just because I pointed it out earlier, but around uh, the escalation of property taxes, right? And those folks who are in units that um, may not fit for them any longer, but they do not have another option in their community um, because their community is only single family housing, right? And so they're kind of in that unit um, with a with a you know property tax burden that continues to elevate. And so where, again, that housing diversity is really important for every one of our communities, but that age in place piece and being able to um, relocate into affordable ho housing that's more affordable for you and fits your family better is an important part of that filtration. And Aaron, just to address not only affordable housing, but for senior housing in general, that we, you know, the baby boomers are the fastest growing demographic right now, the, the 65 and older group. Um, and if we provided more quality choices, and I'm not talking about just affordable, but, but better uh, 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 choices for older adults, whether it's a condominium, like an EPCON unit, if we're familiar with EPCON, um, or uh, affordable low-income housing tax credit senior housing, um, uh, different other uh, types of apartments that may be for only seniors. If we can get seniors to make a decision to move out of that house, that then creates a house that somebody else can move into that could be you know, that's often in those desirable neighborhoods like Grandview and Bexley and, and Worthington. So, um, you know, if there's anything that we can continue to do to encourage the development of senior specific housing that's attractive to seniors to make it easy to move into senior housing, I think it's going to help with this continuum of housing conundrum that we're into where we don't have enough housing right now. And to hitch my wagon to the sort of yes and conversation we've been having, we have talked a lot about the need for new housing production. Equally important is preserving existing housing stock and helping folks of all ages, but particularly older residents to remain in their homes. And so there are some programs out there. Morpsey has a residential services program. The city of Columbus has a residential services program that can help older adults with the retrofits that they need so that they can remain in their homes and age in place if that's what their preference is to do. Um, but we need to be thinking kind of broadly across the housing spectrum and how we can be providing resources to help households and homeowners remain in their homes. Thank you for that. Um, so 
Understanding that communities need to respond quickly to the growth that's occurring, how can we collectively use this opportunity to develop new housing in the most environmentally sustainable manner um, to avoid adding pollution and climate emissions and loss of green space? I mean, for me, again, I'll lean back on the location, right, and not having folks in personal vehicles driving very, very far distances um, is a way that we can have a, a development pattern that is more environmentally sustainable on kind of the, the more global um, look at our community. And I think, you know, we are a city of corridors and where we can, again, kind of, you know, couple up the housing density with transportation options, I think is a really important part of, um, addressing that part of our growth that will also be an impact to our community. Housing and transportation are really, I think, inextricably linked. Um, there's an important effort underway right now called Link Us, and that is kind of centered on the idea of a holistic multimodal transportation system so that we could bring high capacity transit, a way of getting more people uh, more efficiently from place to place more quickly. But it's not just transit, it's also thinking about those important bikeway connections and sidewalk connections, a truly multimodal approach to transportation. Um, but Linkus is more than just that. I think it really has this equitable way of kind of viewing our approach to kind of holistic growth and thinking about how we can make housing and jobs and education and healthcare more accessible across Central Ohio and particularly to those who are perhaps um, most vulnerable or in greatest need. And these are the kind of things that not only are going to do more good for more residents, but specific to the, the question about sustainability, the sustainability impacts of thinking this way, of growing this way are huge, right? So there's so many benefits to being thoughtful about our growth and thinking about housing and transportation together. I'd like to follow up a little bit different direction, and that kind of follows up with Aaron's comment about zoning and creating a sustainable plan that, you know, if you really truly make something environmentally sensitive, it's going to increase the cost of housing. But if we are able to put together developments in central Ohio where it's more walkable, um, there's a greater street presence, um, uh, we can start to design smaller houses that don't require the the, the kind of materials that go into it that's so wasteful that, you know, 20, 20 years ago, the big McMansion idea now is finally out the window. But, you know, if we can find a way to find more of these planned developments that integrates single family housing, multifamily housing, for rent, for sale housing within a walkable community, I think we can go a long way to reduce our, our environmental impacts. Thank you. And I think we only have time for one more um, so for this last question, um, are there any new plan or are there any new plans um, for policy to provide affordable housing, such as the development of community land trusts or mixed income complexes that enable um, an equal participation among low, low and higher income residents, rather like a 50-50 rule um, instead of the usual 80-20 rule? which often results in informal modes of discrimination and attrition of low income groups. I mean, from the city of Columbus standpoint, you know, we work regularly with um, the Central Ohio Community Land Trust, which was started, I don't know, three or four or five years ago, um, that they have done uh, housing construction to support low income home ownership um, throughout the county. Uh, and they are uh, supported by a lot of these different jurisdictions to bring that housing into those communities. And I think that's a really um, important part of making sure that we have that stability and that diversity in the community. Well, you know, again, to take kind of the development side of it, uh, Aaron and Jen, you know, anytime you require additional low cost, low rent or low cost housing, it's going to increase the cost someplace else. And that's the reality of it. And, you know, I, I think we can make an impact on some individual developments to try to diversify the kind of, of um, housing costs that, that, are, that folks are subject to. But, you know, the simple reality is housing costs will go up every time we have to add a low cost unit someplace. And not to say I'm against that idea, but, the re but what we really need is to increase housing production 
across the entire region and not just for specific income groups, because as they say, you know, increased housing choices is going to raise all boats that will by by providing more choices. Eventually, there's going to be more choices for low and moderate income households, which, again, I think is a broad enough strategy that we can apply to the Intel development that we've got to have more housing. We've got to find a way to deliver housing more equitably and, and in larger quantities in order to make a dent in, in the housing situation we've got. I think you're seeing some innovative partnerships among um, kind of our market rate developers alongside our affordable housing developers, uh, where they are looking at ways in which they can partner uh, to support those affordable projects. One in particular is kind of providing all of the parking that was required for an affordable housing uh, new project that's going into a community. And so the opportunity to kind of make sure that um, those cost burdens aren't put on that affordable project allows them to do that project in a neighborhood that otherwise might have been cost prohibitive. And so that is uh, an example of some of the ways our, our development community is starting to innovate and starting to work together in those partnerships, which I think will be um, really important and impactful in the community. Hey, Jennifer, you want to make a last statement? <laughs> <laughs> I think what was said was really wonderful. I don't know that I can add anything to it. I think what, what we've heard from both Rob and Erin on this last question just reinforces the reality that we all have a role to play in this. And there's so many different ways that we can come at this issue. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Erin. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Robert, for a fantastic discussion. Great panel. We, we chose you guys well, we can tell. Um, we appreciate you taking time and sharing with the community this conversation about the impacts of Intel on housing. I just want to remind the audience that we're continuing this conversation for the remainder of the summer. On July 15th, we'll talk about development, economic development, July 29th, transportation, and then finally on August 5th, we'll talk about impacts on energy and water. So again, go to cura.osu.edu to um, find out more information about these events and sign up for our newsletter. And um, we hope to see you again on July 15th. Thanks everyone and have a good day and a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you.